think better than an iPad is too high of a bar for tonight. So <laughs> maybe like an iPhone or something like that. But I'm so glad to be here. This is my first time in Little Rock. And I am so impressed with the vibrant nonprofit sector that I've seen here. And this is the largest YNPN chapter that I've seen. I've been doing this book tour across the country and visiting a lot of the young nonprofit professional networks and emerging practitioners and philanthropy networks. And this is the largest by far. So there's something amazing happening in Little, Mar Little Rock, and I'm glad that you guys are a part of it. So I'm Trista Harris. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I'm the executive director of the Headwaters Foundation for Justice, which is a community foundation. But my passion is really helping to connect young people into careers in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. I think it's very easy to get frustrated and not be able to find your way in the sector. And I know that when I first started in the field, that was my big frustration. It's not like you're an accountant and you started as a junior accountant and you move out up eventually or a partner. It's much more confusing in the nonprofit sector. And so Rosetta Thurman and I wrote this book, um, How to Become a Nonprofit Rockstar, because it's really filled with all of the advice that we wish that we had when we first started our careers in the nonprofit sector. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is six ways to rock your nonprofit career. And these are really broad areas that I think are critical for people in a lot of sectors, but especially in the social sector where you're trying to create change and not being able to, to move or grow in your career can be a barrier to creating the change that you want to see in the world. So I'll go through each of these areas as we talk today. The first one's about developing expertise. And the, the funny thing for me is the first time that we, we wrote the first draft of the book and we sent it to some senior leaders in the nonprofit sector and said, what do you think, what's missing? And they said, make sure you tell young people that they have to do a good job. I'm like, I think people know that they have to do a good job. And they said, no, I don't think they know. You should, you should say you have to do a good job. So you have to do a good job to move up in the nonprofit sector. Um, I think there's this... Um, stereotype about Gen X and Gen Y workers that everybody just wants to run the organization right away and they don't want to do the hard work that it takes to get there and they go from organization to organization. I think it's true that people move from organization to organization and we look at our careers differently, but I don't think it's about, um, hard work isn't about sitting in a desk for 80 hours. Hard work is about the impact that you're making in the field and that looks different when different people are doing that. So developing expertise is really about your current position that you're in, doing the best that you can and what does that look like? Is it meeting with people that do similar jobs to yours and figuring out kind of what the secret sauce is to the position? I used to be a program officer, and that's a job that nobody knows how to do until they get the job. You kind of pretend in the interview like you could do it. Um, and then once you get the job, you Google how to be a program officer and try to figure out how you're going to do it. Um, when I became a program officer, it was about talking to people in the field and saying, how do you do a site visit? What are the things that you ask? How do you know if this organization can really pull it off or not? So in your own positions, figuring out who are people that you really admire that do things well, and you want to learn from them how they do that. Because when you really shine in your position, people pay attention to that. There's a, a funny Oprah quote where she says, if you're making fries, make them the best that you can and make everybody in your line because they want to get your fries because people recognize excellence regardless of where it is. So if you're an intern in an organization or in an administrative role or just starting out, if you shine in those positions, people notice that. Next is building your network. This is especially critical now. Um, it's always been important. Everybody says build your network, meet people, blah, blah, blah. And we all have a million contacts, either a pile of business cards in our office or people that we put in Outlook. Building your network is really about how you utilize those relationships and how you develop networks of people that can help you create change in the community. I think it's really critical to have a wide um, variety of people that you spend time with and you, that you learn with, because often we get stuck in our own silos, our nonprofit silo, our organizational silo, people that are our age. People that are different from you have different ways of approaching problems, and that's the only way that we're going to get to the crux of a lot of the social issues that we see in our communities. Some of the tactical things to build networks are coming to things like this and talking to people, of all things. Um, 
meet people, figure out who they are, what are the sort of work that they do, and then keep track of those relationships. The other thing is joining professional associations, things like the Young Nonprofit Professional Network, um, things that are specific to your position. There's association of fundraising professionals and those sorts of things. Finding people that do similar work as you is a, a great way to build your network. The other way that I've been able to build my network is to create your own. So when I, uh, a few years back, I really loved my job. I had a lot of things that I was frustrated about, but all of my friends that I spent time with all hated their jobs. So anytime I would complain about work, they'd go, you should quit. Well, I don't want to quit. I love my job. Um, and so it was hard to find that space for the kind of um, support that you need to be able to move forward in your career. So I talked to somebody that I went to grad school with, and we were expressing this similar sort of issue. And she said, well, we should meet together and kind of talk about this and bring some other people. So we decided there were some things that we wanted to be similar. We wanted it to be all women, all between the ages of 25 and 35. There was going to be six of us total. We would, me and her and somebody else would each invite somebody, but we wanted everything else to be diverse. We wanted diversity in people that were married and unmarried with kids, without kids, um, people that worked in different sectors. So we had people from business and nonprofits and government, um, academics. And the other common thread was that we all really cared about our community. That was something that was important, and we wanted other people that understood that. So we ended up having one person that dropped out of the group, and so we called ourselves the Fab Five. So we met once a month, still do, and it's a way of holding each other accountable. And if I say, I'm going to make have that really hard conversation at work. I have four women that I know next month are going to say, how'd that conversation go? So it may be the day before we're meeting that I have that hard conversation, because I know they're going to ask about it. Um, but it's, it's really critical, and I think it makes a difference to have that sort of support that doesn't often fit into networks. The other thing that I think has been funny as I've been doing the book tour is I meet people, and that's one of the things that I talk about is how to build your, your Fab Five group. And I met this woman, and she said, oh, I, I'm meeting with my Fab Five group next week. And I said, that's so weird. I'm part of a Fab Five. And she's like, I know I got it because I read the book. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. So it's nice when things actually get implemented and it makes a difference for people. The next is establishing a great personal brand. So I'm from Minnesota, where um, it's sort of the don't look at me state. And people hate when I talk about brand. They say, I'm not a brand. I'm not a shoe. You can't you know, make me have a brand. Um, but when I go to New York and talk about it, people are like, oh, of course I have a brand, You know, obviously. So it, it fits different in different places. But a brand is really something that everybody already has. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's that common conversation when they talk about you and what you bring to the organization and what your, what your skills are. A really great brand has consistency, clarity, and authenticity. So if I talk to two people about you, if they're saying similar things, then I go, oh, that must be what sort of person that she is. Clarity means that the brand makes sense. I have a friend that um, runs a consulting firm, and I've talked to him about 10 times about what he does, and I still couldn't describe it to anybody. It's like entrepreneurism and innovation and all these things. I'm like, what do you actually do? So a, a brand has to be clear, and it has to be authentic. It really has to be you. It can't just be something that you make up. Um, that's easier and easier with social media to make up a brand about yourself, but when people meet you in person and they hear about the work that you do, it really has to be backed up by who you are and what, what you bring to the field. It's great that we have social media because there's a lot of places that you can strengthen your brand. LinkedIn, I think, is a wonderful place to start. Um, it's kind of like an online resume, but you can be much more flexible about the things that you add and the descriptions that you have about what you've brought to your organizations. You can have endorsements from people and that sort of thing. Um, I always say to include a photo in your, your LinkedIn description. A lot of people don't do that. When you're meeting with somebody for an informational interview or lunch, they're going to Google you. One of the top things that will come up are those sort of sites, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, those larger sites that aggregate a lot of information. And so people are going to go there and try to figure out who you are and what the conversation is going to be about. Um, I will say this about social media. It can be very overwhelming, and I know a lot of people hate Twitter. 
I can't stand it. Um, they think Facebook is a pain in just places that you run into people that you didn't want to run into from elementary school. And all of those things are true. Um, but it's also a great place for people to understand who you are as a person. And when you're interviewing for jobs, more and more often a social media audit is part of that. They're going to Google you and figure out what you bring to the table. Uh, as an individual and as the work that you bring. So ignoring that piece of your brand doesn't make any sense because other people are going to see it. Um, it's easier for me because my name is Trista. There's not a lot of Tristas except for some girl that was on The Bachelorette that's wrecked my Google results. Um, <laughs> So if you have a very common name, it's even more important that you use sites like that where you can have descriptions about the sort of work that you do so people will look up Jennifer Anderson nonprofit and those are the ways that they can connect with you. So it's, it's important to have that presence. But branding isn't just online, it's also in person. And so when people meet you in person and you're introducing yourself at events and that sort of thing, how you describe yourself is how other people start to talk about you. So I, I was in a meeting and somebody, as we were going around the table, he said, oh, I'm so-and-so and I work here. Um, and they said, oh, I'm just here to take notes. OK, just here to take notes. Do you have a name? Do you have, you know? Could you introduce yourself? Um, too often we say, I just do this, I'm just this. It's important if you don't take that leadership role about how you describe yourself, nobody else is gonna take that opportunity for you. So you can say, I'm Jane, I manage internal communications, and today I'm gonna be taking the notes for the meeting so that people know what you're doing, but they also know what larger role that's a part of. The other piece for branding that I think is important if you're looking for a job outside of your current organization, and I know that there's a lot of people that are here today with their bosses, so I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about other people in the audience <laughs> that are thinking about that. Um, personal business cards are really critical. So if you're trying to move to a different sector or do a different type of work, having a personal business card helps people connect with that aspirational piece of your brand rather than the current piece. So let's say now you work in communications, but you'd really like to become um, a social media expert and you want people to hire you for that, but you're doing more traditional communications. If I got your business card for right now and I looked at it, I'd think, oh, there's this communications position, maybe this person's a fit, I should forward it on to them. But if I get your personal business card and it says social media expert available for consulting or here's where you can contact me or here's the different social media places that I'm available, then people connect that with you and you're more able to move that brand forward. There's a lot of places to get um, very cheap or free business cards. Um, Vista Print is one where you just pay for the shipping and you get cards. So I have probably seven or eight different types of personal business cards. I have some for the book. I have some for the blog. Um, I have a family business card, which my kids cannot stand at all. Um, it's got everybody's name and my cell phone in case parents need to connect. And my daughter's like, I am not giving this to anybody. Please stop. But I just had to pay for shipping, so it was an easy lesson to be learned. Um, the other one that I really love are Moo cards, Moo like the cow noise. Um, Moo cards are really beautiful and you can do different pictures on the back and it's a great way to leave an impression with people when you meet them. So I have um, Moo cards that have uh, pictures of the book that are on the back. I have some for Headwaters where I work, all of our different program areas. We have a different visual that goes along with it so that when I meet with different donors, I can show them the different cards and figure out which part of our work they're most excited about. So there's a lot of technology tools that I think are making it easier to brand yourself. Next is practicing authentic leadership. And you know, I talk to too many people that say, oh, I'll learn how to be a leader once I'm in a leadership position. Um, and you're never gonna get to that leadership position if you don't develop those skills before. And it doesn't have to be a, a catch-22. Well, if I'm, how could I ever get a position being a manager if I've never managed people? There's lots of ways to build those skills and experience, even if it isn't part of your job title. So volunteer opportunities, being on a board. Boards manage executive directors. That is management experience. Um, those, are, those are ways to really expand the skill set that you have and deepen it so that you're more prepared for your current nonprofit job and whatever your next nonprofit job is. The other thing that you can do within your own organization is to lead a committee or lead a project that other people don't want to lead. So there's many opportunities 
strategic planning, as organizations are going through HR changes and they're trying to figure out how to restructure the organization, a law or a policy change that influences your organization, if you're thinking about collaborating with a new partner, that's all extra work and a lot of people don't want to take on extra work. So there's lots of spaces to really grow. I will go back to the piece about doing a good job in your current position. You have to have a handle on your current work and have to be trusted with that before people will let you take on these stretch assignments. Because if they feel like you're not handling what you're doing right now, then how could we ask you to do this stretch piece? For me, my best stretch assignment was when I was at the St. Paul Foundation, which is a community foundation in Minnesota. And we were doing our 10-year strategic plan for grant making. And the, the CEO met with all the vice presidents and gave the assignment to them for them to develop the strategic plan for their area. And our vice president of grants had too much to do and didn't want to do it. So he delegated it to his associate vice president, who also had too much to do. And so when I was meeting with her, she had piles of projects that she was working on. She said, oh, I've got this project. I don't want to do it. I've got too much going on. And I said, I'd love to. How about you let me you know, take the first run at it, and then you can decide what to do next. So I took it home. I didn't know how to do a foundation strategic plan. So once again, I Googled it. and figured out how to do it. Um, I had a new Mac, and so I knew how to put pictures into documents. So I had pictures of our grantees and the different areas that we were working on, and then came back with this plan. And she's like, it's got like pictures. Like, this is like a real plan. Um, so she gave it to the, the vice president, and his, his joke was that the three different generations that we represented, for me, I've got the, the version with the pictures. He said if she had done it, it would have been a Word document. If he had done it, he would have written it on his yellow notebook and had somebody else figure it out. Um, but for, for me, that stretch assignment was an opportunity to learn something that was completely out of my job description and do something that I found out that I was really passionate about. So when I interviewed at Headwaters, one of the screening questions that they had about getting people that had either experience being a foundation executive director or not was, do you have experience running a strategic planning process for a foundation? And I was like, I do have experience doing that. Um, so it prepared me for the role that I was in and was something that if I hadn't have stretched, I wouldn't have been qualified for my current position. Next is planning for balance. All of those things that I just said don't matter if you're completely burnt out and you leave your organization. It's important to find that balance and space so that people stay in the sector. There's a lot of studies of young professionals where people say they're not going to stay because they see their executive directors working 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours a week, completely burnt out and no longer able to connect to the thing that they were so passionate about when they first started in the organization. And people say, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, having balance between work and all of the other things that you're passionate about are critical to be able to stay in the sector. So within the organization, things that you can do are to remind yourself of what made you want to do this work in the first place. When I was at Girl Scouts, it was about going to visit the camps when the girls were there and seeing the experience that they had. And it made it easier to fundraise because I knew why I was doing the work. Even when there was piles of paperwork to do and all those sort of things, um, I felt connected to what was happening the other thing that I do is I have a file of thank you notes that I keep in my office. And it's, you know, when I've made grants to kids programs and they draw the picture and that sort of thing, or if it's somebody that I've had an informational interview with and they send me a note, I keep all of them for the days that I feel like a complete idiot. Because then I can look in the file and go, you know what, one day I was smart enough and was nice enough that somebody thought they should write me a note about that. And maybe I could pull it together and do that again today. Um, so those sort of things really help refresh you when you just feel like I've hit the wall, I can't do it anymore. The, the other thing that's important is cutting out the pieces of your day and the pieces of your work that aren't helping you accomplish what you want to accomplish. So there's this 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the things that you do give you 80% of, of the results. So if you can figure out in your work, what are the, the few things that I'm doing that are giving me big results and how can I do more of those things? And then what's the other stuff that's just taking up a lot of time and energy? I've, I've heard of people doing this with their email where they do email bankruptcy. So you hear about people that have you know 7,000 things in their inbox and they never can kind of come out of it. They erase everything and it's just gone, which terrifies me a little bit. Um, but they just start from scratch. And if it's important enough, 
that it comes back and somebody asks, oh, I thought we were going to have that meeting, let's, let's get that scheduled, then it's important enough to pay attention to. But most of those things that are constantly dinging us all the time, come go to this, do this, it isn't that important to what you're trying to accomplish. You know the 20% of things that are making a difference. Make more space for those things and cut out those other pieces that are not getting you where you need to go. Um, on the home side, I've got two kids. I have a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old, and they make me feel unbalanced every single day. I'm like chasing after them. They got basketball practice, and somebody forgot a shoe, and like all this stuff. And it, it makes you feel completely off. And so I, I talked to a woman who um, runs a corporate foundation in Minnesota. She's a single mother of a teenager. And I'm like, how do you do that? You're, you're doing this nationwide work. You're traveling all the time. How do you balance it? And she said, the only way to make it work is you have to hire a wife, which sounds very weird. Um, and so I said, well, what do you mean? Like, where do you find these wives? What does this look like? Um, <laughs> And she said, in the 1950s, there was hypothetically this wife when executives came home from work, so it was always the men, they'd come home, and their slippers are out, and there's like a cigar and a drink, and dinner's ready, and the kids' faces are all clean, and their doctor's appointments have been made, and all that stuff's been handled, all those little things that drive you nuts that are in the back of your head all the time. Somebody was figuring that out. I don't know if that person actually really existed in the 50s, but whatever. So there's this idea that that exists. All of those things are still important and need to be handled, even if you're really busy. And even if you're in a single household or in a two-person household where both people are working, it's too much for one person to handle. And so you've got to think about what are the pieces that you can let go of so that you have the time and space to do the things that you're passionate about. So for me, I'm a terrible cook terrible. Um, and I hate going to grocery stores because there's too many decisions that have to be made. It's You walk down the aisle and there's like 30 type, types of canned tomatoes and I'm like, I've been making decisions all day. I don't want to have to think about what type of canned tomato. So there are these services that are like food factories. I don't know what they call them, but what you do is you do a month's worth of food in an hour or two. And there's a recipe and it's listed and it says three green scoops of this and two of this and this much spice. And you put it in the bag and my favorite part is there's a sticker that goes on the front that says cook this at 350 degrees or stick it in the skillet and do it for this long. So when I come home at the end of the day there's this bag that tells me exactly what to do um, and it's just done. Now for Rosetta that co-authored the book with me, she loves to cook and she hates when I tell the story about this like food factory because that's what relaxes her. That's the thing where she feels really centered and connected and it makes her happy. So don't get rid of things that you like to do at home. Get rid of the things that you can't stand that drive you crazy. Um, the other place that I love to outsource things is to my children. So. They do their own laundry, they're responsible for their own homework, if they forget their assignment, they're out of luck. It's one person can worry about a problem, and if it is their schoolwork or their responsibility, they have to worry about it. I'm not going to say, did you do it, did you do it, did you do it, because it's, it's their responsibility to do that. So that's taken a lot of weight off my shoulders on the home front, so that when I'm home, I can do the things that I enjoy and spend time with them in a way where I feel like we're all getting something out of it rather than me just continuing my day of running around. The last piece is moving up. So I think a lot of us think if we do a good job, people are going to notice and we're going to get promoted. My, my very <laughs> first job, um, I really liked it and I was doing a lot of work, I was raising a lot of money, I thought I was going to get this promotion and so I have my sit down with my supervisor and she says, oh yeah, it's great, you're going to get a 2% raise and I was like, but what I thought, um, and so I left and then went and cried in the bathroom like a big grown up and then um, called my husband and told him I had to quit my job and he said, why don't you just tell her? that you thought you were going to get a promotion and here's why you deserve it. I'm like, like, say that to her? It's like, you should probably say that, otherwise she won't know. And I'm like, well, that would be weird for me to say. I'm from Minnesota, so you don't say what you think, very <laughs> passive aggressive. Um, and so I went back and I said, here's why I'm frustrated. I, you know, I thought that this is what was going to happen. I've been doing all this work and I thought I was going to get promoted. And she's like, oh. Yeah, that probably makes sense. Okay, she came back in a week. Um, and it was a promotion that was better than what I thought that I was asking for. So 
being able to really say what you need is critical and having that conversation, even though we work in the social sector and you're not supposed to talk about those things because we're all doing it for the kids or doing it for the SEALs or doing it for whoever, um, it's important that people are adequately compensated for the work that they do and able to have a career progression that makes sense. And, uh, you know, our bosses aren't psychics and they don't know what we want and so you have to be able to say that. The other thing that I think is critical is crafting a professional development plan for yourself. Some organizations do that as part of the review process. They say, what do you want to learn? Um, you have to think for yourself, what's my long-term career goals and how do I want to get there and what's it going to take? The, the easiest way to think about it is um, kind of designing your dream fellowship. Sometimes we'll get these emails about a fancy fellowship where you get to, you know, you're going to study this and you're going to meet these people and you get to write about this and present at this conference and it'll be so wonderful. If you really break it down, the pieces that excite you are things that you could probably do on your own. You don't need somebody to bestow a fellowship on you to make it happen. It's nice when they do, um, but it's not necessary for your development for somebody else to say, you can learn about this topic. You can talk to people that care about this issue. You can always put in a presentation for, for a conference. Um, it's those sort of things that I think we all really need to take charge of in our own career so that we're ready to move to that next level. Um, I think the other place that sometimes people get stuck is figuring out what that next thing is. And sometimes that has to do with really loving the work that you're currently in. So it's hard to think about what the next thing is. Sometimes it's just about being stuck. Sometimes it's about being so burnt out that you can't even imagine what you're gonna have for dinner, let alone what you wanna do for 10, you know, 10 years from now. For me, the activity that I use when I get stuck is um, this lottery exercise. So I think about if I won $100 million in the lottery, which you shouldn't play the lottery because you're not gonna win and it's a poor people tax and all that sort of thing, but you know, whatever, go with me here. Um, so think about if you won $100 million, what would you do? So for some people, they would quit their jobs right away. That's probably a sign that you don't like your job and you should think about what you want to do. Um, for other people, they say, I, you know, I travel and I buy these things and I do whatever. All of that gets really boring after year one or year two. So what would you do to fill your time if money wasn't the issue? Um, what are the sort of projects that you'd like to work on? What really excites you? And for me, as somebody that works in the philanthropic sector, it's like, well, if I had $100 million, I'd like to give away money. Well, I already do that. So what are the, what are the pieces about it that would really make me excited? And as I went through that activity for myself, I realized that I wanted to spend more time with social entrepreneurs, people that are changing the world, some through nonprofits, some through for-profit businesses. And as I was trying to dig deeper about why was that the thing that excited me so much, it's spending time with people that are passionate about what they do. And at my foundation, I wasn't spending as much time with grantees because we have volunteers that are making those decisions. And I realized that that's what I really missed. I miss talking to people that are passionate about how they're changing their world. So I need to create more space in my schedule where I get to talk to people and do that. So doing that kind of daydreaming activity helps you think about what is the next phase? What are the things that I need to build into my current job to make me satisfied so that I can stay in the field and have the impact that I'd like to have in the long term? So we're gonna take some time for question and answers, but if you think of questions later that you'd like to ask me, I'm on Twitter at Trista Harris, um, or tristaharris.org is my blog, and I try to keep it as an ongoing conversation about what's happening in the future of the philanthropic and nonprofit sector, um, but also some of these professional development conversations as well. So I look forward to your questions. Okay, before we uh, open it up for questions, two, uh, two items. One, um, if, if we sell out of books, if you will just come, leave your name and address and phone number, contact information, we're gonna have more books ordered and we can uh, get those books to you when they arrive. So. If there's not any books and you want one, sign up for one over here at the table. Secondly, a couple of you have already asked me about um, the partnerships with the Clinton School, the organizations that work with us on, on projects and that we go through, as you know, every year and select organizations. That informational meeting is Wednesday, January the 18th at 3 p.m. here. So if any of your organizations are interested in having a Clinton School team or a Clinton School student working with them, uh, please uh, try to come to that meeting. And Julianne Dunn, who's our Assistant Director of Field Services in the back, and we'll be glad to answer any questions 
but I just want to respond to those of you that, that raised that issue. Now, questions for Trista. Raise your hands. Surely this, in this crowd, <laughs> all the questions are not answered. <laughs> Yes, sir, there's a question. Derek Rainey, there's a Clinton School student. D. Rainey, you, <laughs> if you were in my class, I'd give you an A. <laughs> Let's wait for, the, wait for the microphone. Sorry. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Derek. I'm a student here. And just wanted to hear your thoughts on the rise of nonprofits and those going into the nonprofit field. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about those who do the same work but want to create their own nonprofit? versus joining one. Yeah. Um, I have a couple feelings on that. I think one of the things that's happening is, as baby movers are beginning to retire, the traditional media is encouraging them to start nonprofits. That's a fun thing to do when you leave. Um, what I tell people when they come and talk to me about their idea and they'd like to start a nonprofit, um, starting a nonprofit will kill your dream. Whatever the thing was that you were passionate about, you don't get to do that anymore as soon as you start a nonprofit because then you've got to fill out tax forms and you're fundraising and you're doing all of these pieces. Um, the other thing that I'll say is I've, I've seen a really exciting rise in organizations as well. And there's some frustration from the traditional nonprofit sector where people say things like, well, young people aren't joining the Rotary and so it's a kind of collapse of society. There's new organizations that are starting out that are fitting new needs. And I think that that's an important thing that needs to happen in the nonprofit sector. And we shouldn't get so tied to the institution piece of the work that we do, but more tied to what are the things that we're trying to accomplish through that work. And sometimes it's a new type of nonprofit that can do that. Sometimes it's becoming a program of something else that already exists. And sometimes it's being a for-profit enterprise. It doesn't always have to fit neatly within the nonprofit sector if you're trying to improve the world. So I think there's some really positive changes that are happening. Um, and I, I think there are a lot of nonprofits. And for a lot of them, they're having a hard time fundraising and having a hard time doing the things that they're passionate about. And I think when it gets that tough, it's important to look around and figure out, is there another way that I could be doing this work? Questions? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Chris. So obviously the principles that are in your book, hey again, Trista. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, the principles in your book are applicable to not only emerging leaders, but also mm -hmm. um, those who are more seasoned in their careers. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the feedback and reaction has been mm -hmm. since we have a pretty good mixed crowd today of those who are you know, more seasoned and, and a, further, a little further along in their careers yeah. about what they thought about the book. Yeah, what I, we did an earlier lunchtime session with the Philanthropy Roundtable, and what we heard from somebody that had recently retired is he wished he had this the year before he retired, because that's the time that you're starting to really think about what's next um, and building that next phase of the work that you do. Um, you know, I think it's very easy to feel like you're a finished product, like, oh, I finished grad school, I know everything I need to know about the nonprofit sector, I'm ready to go. And it's, it's an ongoing process. Professional development is never done. I found for me, talking about this topic a lot means I have to pay attention to my own professional development, otherwise I get in trouble with the people that I'm talking to. And we were doing a, a intensive leadership retreat in DC. And I realized that the advice that I was giving to somebody about, she was, she was really trying to compare herself to people that that was the only thing that they were doing. So she was, she was blogging, she was also working at an organization and was competing in her mind with people that were doing just that. They were full-time bloggers, they were full-time working in their organizations. They weren't trying to balance the million things that she was balancing. And I realized that I do that for myself as well, where you know I'll look at somebody who is blogging or consulting full-time and I'll go, oh, I wish that I had written that many posts. I wish that I had done that. Or people that are just foundation executive directors that are doing that all the time go, oh, it's a really good program. I wish that I had found the time to do that sort of thing. The place that I do it um, in the worst way is with stay-at-home moms. So I have a seven-year-old son and he's playing soccer and it was very hot. And I was just happy that I got him the water bottle when we left the door. Like it was a big pat on my back that I remembered that we needed to grab that before we went out into the 100 degree heat. And then we got there and one of the moms had got, um, she had made ice packs for all of the kids on the team to wear around their necks when they got hot with their names on it and little pretty designs. 
I'm like, man. So I'm like beating myself. Oh, I wish I had brought ice packs. And my husband is like, that's all she did today. That's it. That is it. She made those ice packs. She made them beautiful. And it's great. And it's an important. But you tried to do 30 things today. So stop trying to compete with the person that was just making the ice packs. So I think for all of us, regardless of where we are in our careers, it's easy to, to forget those lessons about balance or to think that you have the branding piece completely down. For a lot of senior people in the field, it's hard to remember that you need to continue to build your network. If you have a really strong network, you go, oh, I'm good. But you don't get new perspectives because you're not continuously building that. So I think there's a lot of places for professional development for all of us, regardless of where we are on this journey. Yes, question right here. One of the spaces that I think is really interesting is the blurring of the lines between the traditional nonprofit sector and some more of the social entrepreneurship and even the public sector. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what does it look like to create a multi-sector career? How do, yeah. those, how do your principles sort of expand? Yeah. Um, I think it's critical, and I think more and more people are going to do that. One of the reasons is the crippling student debt that Gen Y especially is facing, you've got to do a lot of different things. Um, I talk a lot about having a side hustle. It's important that you've got something else that's helping you pay your bills so that you're able to really move forward in the career that you care about. And finding a way to do that is critical. For some people, it's consulting. When I, was a, um, when I was a fundraiser and did grant writing, I talked to somebody that ran a fundraising consulting firm and he needed some help with applications. And I said, oh, sure, I could do that. And we figured out where I wouldn't be competing with my organization. It was different geographic areas and that sort of thing. And he said, well, what's your rate? And I said, oh, it's like $20 an hour. I tried to calculate what my salary was and then divide it by 40 hours a week, and then that was my rate. So I worked for him for about six months, and he said, let me just let you know, um, you're doing a really good job, and you should be charging me $75 an hour, and you should do that right after you finish that project that you're working on <laughs> for me. And I'm like, you would pay me more than I make for an hour of work to do this? And he's like, yeah, and I'm charging somebody else even more than that for the work that you do. I'm like, oh, well, I didn't know you could do that. Um, but having that flexibility made me realize that the skill set that I had was valuable to organizations, not just because I worked somewhere, but because I had something else that I could bring to the table. And that helped me stay longer at that organization because they weren't able to give me the salary increase that I wanted, but I was able to have this flexibility to do something on the side. For some people, they teach yoga classes. For other people, it's very closely aligned with the work that they do. A lot of people do consulting or writing or blogging on the side, those sorts of things. So I think finding the space where you can do that is really important. Any other questions? Trista, thank you very much Thanks for being for here. And thank you all for coming. Thank you uh, for the Young Nonprofit Professionals Group uh, and to the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy the programs this semester and come back soon. Thank you all very much. <laughs>